just so happened that the same underwriter got two of his files like two days in a row and noticed, hey, these canceled checks look familiar. The, the numbers, the, the routing numbers, the, the cancellation numbers, everything was identical. I mean, that's, you know, that's uh, obviously that's a problem. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and uh, I'm going to kind of go over my story. I've gone over my story uh, before on Concrete and Valuetainment and Vlad TV and, and a bunch of other a bunch of other uh, YouTube uh, channels, but I've never really gone over my story on my channel. And what I wanted to do was kind of go over the story almost, you know, not, I don't know if necessarily it's chapter by chapter, but I want to go over it in a longer form than the typical 20 minute or hour or two hour, uh, you know, format. I wanted to go through it, kind of take my time and go through the story. And so, uh, basically, if you don't know anything about me, I basically, I was, I was on the run for three, well, I was a mortgage broker. I started committing mortgage fraud. Uh, I ran a bunch of different real estate related scams and credit card scams. And ultimately I ended up going on the run and I was, uh, kind of, you know, I was, you know, on the secret services, most wanted list. I was on the FBI's most wanted list. And I was, I, I was on the run for three years and eventually I got caught and I went to prison. So that's essentially kind of you know this this story and and how those events unfolded uh so i think i'll start with by saying you know that uh, i was raised in tampa florida and i was raised in and i was actually raised in temple terrace which is a separate city but so it's kind of like almost like a, a suburb slash city of tampa i never really say temple terrace because nobody knows where temple terrace is essentially it's florida i mean essentially it's tampa so basically raised in in, uh, in temple terrace and and uh you know my i was raised by a, a strict catholic mother uh my dad was he was never really that religious uh, my father had a uh you know he had an alcohol problem and i was it's funny like my mother my my mother and father uh my mother was unable to have children. She was, uh, she was back then they used to call it being barren. Uh, you know, she just, she wasn't able to get pregnant and they tried for, for years when they first got married and eventually they, they, they adopted, uh, I have a, a sister named Katie and they adopted my sister, Helen. Then they adopted my brother. Like a year later, they adopted my brother. His name is Mark. Then they adopted, uh, Katie, which was my closest sibling. And then, you know, about, eight, 10 years went by and my mother at the age of, I think she was 39 or almost 40. She went in for a hysterectomy. And back then, you know, back then you became, you were 40 years old and women were, you know, this is back in the sixties. They basically were just kind of standard. You were, you were in your forties, you went in for a hysterectomy. So she went in for a hysterectomy. And when the doctor opened her up, he noticed that her ovaries were spongy and he realized Hey, it, did we give this woman a, a pregnancy test? And they were like, "Well, no, she's not able to get pregnant." So they gave her a pregnancy test while she was sitting right, laying right there, unconscious on the table. Came back, said she was pregnant. So they stitched her up. And when she woke up, my you know she woke up, and my dad was there, and he said, uh, "My mom said, how'd the surgery go?" And and he said, "Not as expected." So he said, "You know, you're pregnant." And she was like, "I came in for a hysterectomy. What are you talking about?" And so whatever it was, you know, seven, eight months later, uh, I, w I was born. And so, you know, my brothers and sisters were adopted and I was a, a you know, whatever you want to call it, natural born child. And my, like I said, my father had kind of a, an alcohol, not kind of an alcohol. My father was a drunk. He had an alcohol problem. <laughs> like I'm beating around the bush. Like <laughs> he was a drunk. Okay. So he had an alcohol problem. He had a problem with pills. Uh, he was narcissistic, extremely arrogant, overbearing. And I was, you know, not, I think not the son he wanted. Uh, you know, I grew up and I remember, you know, he, he would get drunk and he would call, you know, he'd call me and my brother stupid and say, we'd never be anything. And then he would call my, you know, brother, my, my sisters, he'd call them names. And, you know, he was just a, a, a nasty drunk. And then he'd sober up and he'd be great for 
three or four months or six months and he would he would be great and he worked for a state farm insurance as a manager he was an amazing manager he was a great salesperson a great sale a great manager uh, hired you know trained uh, agents and i forget what he had like 25 agents he was always winning awards always doing well made a, a great deal of money and i think watching him he was he did so well that even when State Farm realized that he had a major drinking problem, you know, they they would send him to rehabs. Like, they didn't fire him. He'd show up at a meeting drunk. And they wouldn't fire him because he he was one of the leading managers and had the was running one of the leading sales teams of agents uh, in the nation. So instead of firing him, they just kept putting him into rehabs, and they'd sober him up, and he'd be good for a year or two. And then he, or he really, they would think he was good for a year or two. The truth is, he would still go on these, uh, these uh, benders. And uh, I, I remember one time they, one time they were going to get a divorce. Uh, my mom was wanted to get a divorce. My dad wouldn't stop drinking. He was just being a dick. And I remember he drove us out to the projects and told us the whole family and told the whole family that he could afford two of these houses, which really, honestly, looking back, wasn't true. Uh, but he was saying he could afford two of these houses and we would all live in the projects if my mom left him. <laughs> what a dick. Uh, you know, and I was a little kid, too. I remember he, he was like, and you guys will all have to decide who you want to live with. And I remember th- saying, my mom, mom, I want to live with mom. Immediately. Uh, really... You know, one minute I just loved my father to death, and the next minute I just despised him. And he was just belligerent, and he bullied my mother and all of us. He was just a dick. And so, you know, I just know I never lived up to what he wanted in a son. And although I was smart, you know, I I tested high on all the IQ tests that I took and all the oral exams that I would take. Uh, you know, I, I did great. But as far as reading and writing, I did very poorly. I, I had a learning disability. He ended up putting me, they ended up putting me into a couple different schools for kids with learning disabilities. And, you know, I still just didn't do very well. Uh, eventually, I, I ended up graduating high school and I went to college. I, what did I get? I tried to get a business degree. I started with a business degree, but I remember I failed like accounting. No, I didn't fail it. I almost failed accounting too. I got like a C in accounting too. And I almost failed. To be honest, I really did fail it. I really got like a 68 or a 69. And the teacher said, let's round up so I don't have to see you next semester. And I was like, let's do that. And so he rounded up to like 70. And it was like, it was like one of the only C's I ever got. So I switched my, I remember thinking, well, I'll never be able to pass like micro economics and macroeconomics and all these other courses that you had to take to get a business degree. It was just like, that was just never going to happen. Uh, and what I did was I switched to art and I ended up getting a degree in art because I've always been very artistic. I, I graduated, I remember, I gra- so I graduated high school. Well, I'm sorry, when I graduated college, graduated college in like 95, and I was dating a chick that was working as a stripper. She actually, li- we actually lived together for several years. So we, we'd been living together a few years. Her name was Chrissy. And so I graduated, I, I first I went and worked for, uh, I went and worked for a company that was, a couple different companies that were uh, insurance companies as an insurance adjuster. So I ultimately, I thought I was going to be an insurance agent, which I wasn't. I never did. Never That never happened. Uh, I kept taking the aptitude test for these companies to be an agent, and they kept, you know, the aptitude test was like, well, look, he's just not a good fit for being a salesperson. So I ended up being a, a, an insurance adjuster, and I did that for like a year or so, and then eventually I got laid off, and then I started working construction. I could barely pay my bills. And But my girlfriend at the time was working for a company called Eagle Lending. And Eagle Lending did subprime loans. You know, you have conventional loans. This is basically when you walk into Bank of America and they give you a regular type loan where the the, the Fed sets the standard. And so those are, those are conventional or um, they're basically, they're called conventional uh, loans. And so you, then you have subprime loans. So subprime loans are where the bank itself comes up with their own underwriting guidelines and it's not backed by the fed and this company did 
they did uh, subprime loans, and she was actually doing okay at it. She wasn't doing great, but she had just started with the company, and she had met the owner of the company, which is a guy named Kelly Aarons. She'd actually met him uh, at the strip club, believe it or not. Because I know, I know what you're thinking, Connor, you're thinking, I know that you meet a stripper at a strip club and you think, hey, this is the kind of girl that needs to be uh, working as a mortgage broker for my company. Well, believe it or not, that's really probably not true. So, uh, but he met her there and she was getting, she was in college and she was getting her degree in finance. So Kelly ended up hiring Chrissy to work for his company, Eagle Lending, and then went, you know, she came home and, you know, after working there for a while, she came home and she was like, look, you, you got to work. You got to work here. You got to come work at this place. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. So Christy was working for, for Eagle Lending. And so she, she comes home after working there for whatever, a few weeks. And she says, listen, you've got to do this. You have to quit this job. You're working construction. You, you have got to come work at Eagle. You got to be a mortgage broker. You'd be great at it. You were made for this. And I remember thinking like, I, I, there's no way I was going to be able to keep up with the paperwork. And I was like, look, I can't do the paperwork. I don't know. The learning disability, I barely read and write. And she said, no, no. She said, the processors, the processors do all the paperwork. All you have to do is take an application. It's not that hard. Uh, and she said, and you're going to be, you would be great at structuring deals. You're creative, you're smart, you could do this and you're personable. Uh, you're, you know, you can do this. And I, so I went, I met with Kelly and Kelly said, yeah, I'll definitely, I'll, I'll hire you. He talked to me for a little bit and he, they flew me up to, they flew me up to North Carolina for like a week and they put me through a training course and I came back down and within a couple of weeks, I, I was closing, I was going to close my first loan, my first loan. I had, I had run some ads. I had taken uh, called some real estate agents. I was putting out signs. I got this this uh, a girl that wanted to buy a house. I, I had a real estate agent. We found her a house. I got her the loan. I, I put together a loan package. And I remember I went into my manager's office, and her name was uh, her name was Gretchen Zayas. So I walked into Gretchen's office and I gave her the package and she had to look at the package, right? Like you need W-2s, pay stubs, uh, you need cancel checks or you need a verification of rent, you need a verification of deposit. Like you needed all these things in the package before you could send it up to underwriting so they could look at it and determine if they're going to lend her your customer the, the, month, the loan. So I get there and I, I give the package to, to Gretchen and she opens it up. This is my manager. And she starts looking through the pages. Looks at one page and another one. And as she was looking, she's like, that's good. That's good. She took one page out and she put it to the side. And then she kept looking and looking. And then she goes, man, it looks perfect. And I was like, I looked at the one. I said, well, what about this? She goes, well, this is a verif your verification of rent. I went, right, right. And she said, you never looked at it, did you? And I went, N well, I mean, no. The processor sent it off. The management company mailed it back. She says she's been, she was at her last place two or three years. She paid her rent. She's like, she did pay her rent, but she has a 30 day late payment. So my customer had been 30 days late on one of her rent pay payments. And although she had caught it up and it was only, it was six or eight months ago, Gretchen said, because of that, she can't get the loan. And I was like, Oh my. And I remember too, listen, I'd been working there. So I'd, I'd already, I was all, hadn't really worked in three weeks. Like I'd been working, but they're not paying you. You don't get paid unless you, you close something. So I'd gone almost three weeks to a month without getting paid for anything. And by the time this loan, if it did close, I was going to be a month. It would have been a month since I'd been paid. So I'm behind on everything. Like I banked everything on doing well at this company. I was behind on my mortgage payment. I was behind on, how old was I? I was like 28? So I was behind on everything. I'm on my mortgage payment. I was behind on my car payment. I'm behind my credit cards. I mean, I got credit cards getting canceled. I mean, things are bad because I was thinking I am going to do great at this. I loved it. I loved the idea of it. And I could tell I was good at it. I knew I was going to excel at it. Well, I looked at the, I looked at the verification of rent. And I was like, oh man, I remember just thinking this is horrible. Like I'm going to, I'm going to lose everything. And 
I said, well, what do I do? And Gretchen goes, she pulled out a bottle of white out and she started clicking it like this. And I remember, you know, the old bottles, like that was before they had the tape ones, they had the bottle. And, she would, and I, I was like, and she, she gave it to me. She goes, if I was you, I would white out the 30 day late, make a copy of it, stick it back in the file, send it to underwriting and the loan's going to close. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, that's, that's bank fraud, isn't it? And, and she went, well, yeah, but listen, the worst that's going to happen and I remember saying, I can go to jail. Like, I'd never broken the law at that point. I'd never. I'd gotten a couple of tickets. Like, I'd never been in trouble before. It, it, breaking the law to me at that point in my life, it was something I, I had never even considered. So uh, I was like, I could go to jail for that. She goes, oh, listen, the worst that happens is under if underwriting catches it, then they'll deny the loan. Maybe if they think you're involved and you whited it out or you knew it was in there, they might fire you, but that's the worst that's going to happen. And, and she was like, if I was you, I'd do it. So I, I went and made a copy of the, I whited it out, made a copy of the verification of rent, stuck it, the copy, the altered copy in the, in the file and mailed it to underwriting. Four or five days later, I get a, an approval. You've been approved to close. A couple of days later, we close. So within a week, I'm at closing. I got a check for like 3,500 bucks. And, and I was like, this is amazing. I just got 3,500 bucks, 3,500 bucks 20 years ago. Was it a nice, that was like a month's salary. Well, I was working on multiple loans within a couple of days. I close another loan within a few days later, somebody else had a problem where they almost qualified for the loan, but they didn't. So the guy made like $42,000 on his, his W2 said he made 42,000, but if the W2 had said he made 47,000. I could get the, get him a loan. So I cut and pasted, the, turned the five into a seven, altered all of the corresponding deductions on the W-2, put it in the file, sent it to underwriting. They didn't catch it. Next thing, you know, and you have to think there's 30 pages, the d- different types of documents in these things. They're calling on, on as many as possible. What, what are the chances that they're going to call on the W-2 and that they were going to say, what exact, how much did he make exactly last year? Typically what they're doing, they're just looking at the ver- what's called the verification of, of employment for the actual numbers, and they're calling the employer just to say, does he work there? Has he worked there for three years or two years or whatever was on the verification of, of employment? If they say, yes, well, he's worked here for four years. Okay, perfect. Did you fill this, a- this out? Yes, we did. Thank you. And that's it. The, but then they'd look at the W-2s for the actual numbers, and the W-2 had been altered. So... That went right through, loan closed, boom, 3,500 bucks. Next loan, that one closes. I closed four loans my first month. By the next month, I closed six loans. The next month, I closed eight, which was more than the, the manager was closing. By the next month, it was 10. Then it was 12. I think the most I ever closed was 12 loans in a month. Then Kelly ended up making me the manager from the Tampa office. He made me the manager of the Brandon office. You know, I never mentioned this in the in the book that I wrote, but what actually happened was by this point, Kelly was sleeping with the girl that I was dating, the girl that got me, that I was living with at the time. So by this point, Kelly was now coming down and sleeping with Chrissy on a regular basis, and I had no idea. He made me the manager of the Brandon office, he made her the manager of the Sarasota office and he bought her a house in Sarasota. So she, but he was basically, the whole thing was like, hey, I'm a, I've got a house, I've got a rental property down there. But in reality, he bought her a house, bought her a house, put her down there so she and I couldn't live together anymore because it was too, too long of a, it was too much of a commute to do every day. It's like an hour and 45 minutes to two hours. So if a two hour drive, every day to see each other. So she and I were still seeing each other. We'd meet in the scent in the middle once or twice a week. But eventually I figured out what was going on and we broke up, which was not you know traumatic for her because she liked Kelly. And by that point, I think Kelly's wife figured it out. She had had a private investigator follow him around. And so within a month or so of me breaking up with her, Kelly's wife kicked him out of the house. He had three boys. So he ends up losing the wife, the three kids, moves in with Chrissy, divorces the wife, they get married, they end up having a kid. 
and they're still married to this day. So it's really a romantic story from her perspective. From my perspective, they're scumbags. But whatever. I mean, you know, it's promiscuous. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, what ends up happening is at some point, the Department of Banking Finance and the FBI closed down Eagle Lending. I think it was for fraud, which I don't think had anything to do with me. Uh, it, they end up closing that whole, that, that company down. Like literally like guys are showing up to, to the office one day and the doors were chained. And what, what had happened with them, the biggest problem was that they had lost a credit line. They had several credit lines and, and from banks and these banks and lenders had closed down the credit lines because of fraud and because loans were, weren't performing. So they closed them down. Department of Banking and Finance came in. They eventually shut them down. By that point, I had moved to another office, another lender, well, actually another mortgage broker. And I very quickly, it was only there like a month or two, and then I started my own company. And my company was called Consortium Financial Services. Uh, and I hired about a dozen guys to work there, uh, brokers, you know, like half, it was actually half and half, about half women, half men. And, you know, and listen, and we were committing fraud right away, right away. We're all committing fraud. It was, and it was, it was so overwhelmingly blatant, the fraud that I was, it wasn't blatant. Like it was blatantly obvious. It was just so, it was. It wasn't like a W-2 or a pay sub. They weren't, they weren't slight alterations anymore. By this point, I was doing things like, by this point, like I was, I was like making my own banks. So I was making online banks where you could go online and it looked like a bank. Or, and I had multiple cell phones. I remember you'd walk in my office and I had like a bank, or, or, or I had like six or seven, I had like a whole row of cell phones. So I've got cell phone. I got like six cell phones with little tags on them on who they were for and what company they were for. I was opening up different corporations so that I could verify people's employment. I would list like the corporation in, in the business directory. One of the things we would do, one of the things I would do is I would make, you know, I would make fake bank statements. And so I'd make, obviously I'd make the fake online banks and I'd make fake corresponding bank statements. I would also make bank statements for other, you know, let's say if I had a, a borrower that was with Bank of America, but they didn't have their down payment in the bank for 90 days, which you'd need to have it 60 to 90 days. What I would do is I would, I had blank cardstock for Bank of America in color, trim down the whole thing. So I could print, I could take your bank statements and I could retype your bank statements and put down that you did have enough money to close so let's say a lot of times like you're going to buy a house and maybe the seller was going to give you your down payment because you didn't have your down payment. So the seller is going to give the down payment. And this makes sense if you're buying, let's say, for the sake of argument, a $200,000 house and you need to put down $10,000. You don't have $10,000. If the seller only wants $190,000, he's willing to bring your $10,000 to closing because he, he just wants to get one ninety, dollars and you don't have your down payment. So he'll bring it because he's just going to get the money right back. Well, you're supposed to have that money in the bank. So I would, so if you had a bank account with Bank of America and you had some money in the bank, I'd, we'd have them either deposit the money in the bank or we'd show the money being in the bank for the past three months using fake bank statements and we'd send those bank statements to the underwriter. The underwriter would look at it and they would say, okay, looks like he does have the money in the bank. And then when you go to closing, the seller would then just take $10,000 and deposit and deposit it in the escrow company or the, t the title company in escrow and then you would close that loan would close. He'd get his money right back and the loan goes through. Hey, sorry for interrupting the video, but want to let you guys know that if you join my Patreon at the top tier every single month, you get a different painting and the contact information for my Patreon page is in the description. Back to the video. So we would do stuff like that, or we would say it was in your currently in your bank that you don't even have a bank account. I would say it was in the bank of Ebor, and I'd have bank statements. And if you called the bank of Ebor, we had someone that would answer the phone as with the bank of Ebor and would verify that you have the funds in the the account. Uh, you know, so that was some of the stuff I was doing. I had uh, canceled checks. I'll give you an example. If let's say you've been late on your rent a bunch of times. Well, you don't have to give a, give them a verification, give, you don't have to give the lender a verification of mortgage. 
mortgage or rent. You don't have to give the the lender a, a verification of mortgage or rent if you can prove you've made your payments every single month via canceled check. And canceled check is a check that's gone through your bank and they've got all the routing numbers and all the cancellation and everything on the check. So I actually dummied up canceled checks from like SunTrust Bank, from Wachovia, from uh, um, from Bank of America, from all kinds of different banks. I would dummy up what lo- appeared to be canceled checks that had gone through for $1,200, $900 every single month for 24 months. And all you had to do, all my borrower, my brokers had to do was put their customer's name at the top upper left-hand corner and their address on each check. So they would make a, a little label and they would glue it on there and then they'd fill out the checks and then they'd sign their customer's name or have their customer sign them and then they'd make copies of them and then they would send them to underwriting. Underwriting would think, oh, look, this is 24 months worth of canceled checks that I can see have gone through the bank for $1,200 on you know, January, February, 1200 uh, you know, January, February, March, April, May, every, you know, 1200, 1200, and you could see them. They look canceled front and back. Perfect. So that's what we, I mean, those are the kinds of things we were doing. It was just, it was just blatant. I mean, we're making, you know, every the, 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 um, the appraisals for the properties were all jacked up. I mean, we're, we're altering appraisals where I'm doing all kinds of stuff. Like I'm doing anything to get these loans to go through and the loans are going through. And the reason I would obviously do this is because, if you went, if one of some customer came in, he'd already been to a few different uh, brokers, or he'd gone to his bank, they turned him down. He went to a credit union, they turned him down. Went to another broker, they turned him down. Then he would eventually get to me, and I'd say, "Yeah, I can do the loan, but the broker fee is forty five hundred dollars, and your interest rate is whatever eight percent." Because what a lot of people don't realize is, let's say your interest rate is going to be. Five percent. I mean, I know interest rates are ridiculously low now, but back then they were like seven or eight percent. So let's say they're going to be your interest rate is going to be five percent. What a lot of people don't realize is, at that time, if you came in and your interest rate should have been five percent, but I told you your interest rate was six percent, and you said, "Okay, I'm cool with that." If I told told for every fifty basis points, or really it was to be honest, it was like thirty five basis points. So each interest rate is made up of a hundred basis points. So if I told you your interest rate was five, it's supposed to be 5%, but if I had said it was 5.35, that means that I get one point on the back of the loan. So if the loan's a hundred thousand dollars and I tell you your interest rate is 5.35 and you say, okay, no problem. I get a thousand dollars back because your interest, because your loan is a hundred thousand dollars. If it's 200,000, I would get 2000 back. I get two points or one point. One point on a two hundred thousand loan is two thousand. So you would come in, guys. People would come in. I'd say, yeah, your interest rate six percent. They would say six percent, man. Uh, should be five percent. Everybody else is doing five, but yeah, but everybody else turns you down. I can do it at six percent. So I'm charging you forty five hundred dollars as a broker fee, and I'm charging you three points. So it's five, not not five. If I at five, let's say you're borrowing a hundred thousand, it would be. Uh, if you're borrowing a hundred thousand dollar loan, and I tell you your interest is five percent, I get nothing on the back. If I tell you it's five point three five, I get one point. If I tell you it's five point seven, it's two point. If I tell you it's six, you know six point zero five, which is three points, I get three points on the back of your loan, which means I get an extra three grand. So I'm charging you forty five hundred up front plus three point plus I get three points on the back of the loan. Your interest rate is higher. Uh, but you have nowhere you can go. I'm able to get the loan through because, because I'm I'm creating canceled checks. I'm saying you have your money in the bank. I'm altering your your W twos and pay stubs. So I'm I'm doing everything I can to get these loans through. And we would get caught all the time. Listen, we got caught one time where I had done owner occupancy fraud for this this person. Uh, there was a woman, uh, a guy I knew, a sheriff's deputy. Actually, he comes up again. So there's a sheriff's deputy. No, wait, this was a real estate agent. We'd done, so if, if let's say I'm going to buy, let's say I want to buy an investment property. If I want to buy an investment property, say I want to buy a duplex and I want to buy a duplex, the bank wants me to put down 20%. So if it's a $100,000 duplex, they want me to put down 20 grand. 
Well, if I say I'm owner occupying that duplex, which means I'm going to, I'm going to tell the bank I live in the duplex, I'm going to move in there. Then the bank says, okay, well, we'll lend you 95%. So you only have to put down 5,000 as opposed to 20. We had a real estate agent one time. She bought, I want to say she bought six or eight owner occupied duplexes. Actually, I want to say it was six, six owner occupied duplexes where she said, I'm living in each one of these duplexes. So obviously I couldn't send all those to the same lender because the same lender would say, well, there's no way you're occupying six duplexes. What I did instead was, well, I didn't even do this. My, uh, one of the brokers that worked for me, her name is Susan Barker did this. She closed one dupl- or one of the du- owner occupied duplexes with let's say bank of America. Another one she closed with, let's say, Household Bank. Another one she closed with, so she closed them with all different banks. And this woman showed up at six different closings like the same day at six different title companies and signed saying she's owner-occupying each one of these duplexes. And she was a real estate broker. So she's a real estate agent and a real estate broker. She had, this is like, so this is like, this is somebody who clearly knew this was fraud. We close, and let's say about two months later, I remember getting, I remember Susan came in my office and she said, listen, I've got a lawyer on the phone from, I want to say it was Washington Mutual or, was it Washington Mutual? No, it was Union Planners. She said, I have a, I have a, a lawyer on the phone from Union Planners. And he said he has two two duplexes that are both owner occupied by the same borrower. And we did both loans. I went, what? So what had happened was one of the, one of the loans we had closed, let's say at Oak street mortgage, Oak street mortgage ended up selling that loan that they had a credit line that was connected to, that was all given to them by union planners. So union planners ended up with that loan. So union planners ended up with two of the same owner occupied properties. And so this lawyer's calling up saying, look, you've committed fraud. You guys did two owner-occupied prop- duplexes at that. Two owner-occupied duplexes with the same borrower using the same information at two different title companies. You clearly knew what you were doing. I remember he's telling, starts talking about commit. He's going to call the, the FBI. He's going to have me arrested. He's gonna, I ended up convincing that guy to let us refinance both of those properties and pay. He also took a short pay. So he took less money. They took union planners took less money than we even owed them. And they paid us a broker fee. So I convinced him to pay us a broker fee and take less money. They, they, they took a hit of like $30,000 just to get rid of, Oh, sorry, just to get rid of these loans. Uh, you know, cause they don't want, here's the thing. Like he started saying, I'm going to call the FBI. This and I was like, Whoa, Whoa, you don't want the FBI showing up. The FBI is going to go through your files. For all the FBI knows, you guys did anything, something wrong. For all you know, the broker that did this at my company was working with someone on the inside of your company. You don't have any idea that the can of worms you're about to open up. Like, be reasonable here. And the guy was like, I said, look, how about this? Let me just refinance him. He was like, I was hoping you would say that. And so he, he I convinced him. And I'm like, yeah, the problem is I can't refinance it and pay off the balance. I said, I'd need a short pay. And he goes, well, how much would I have to reduce it? I mean, he immediately, he's ready to start reducing them. He reduced it. And I was like, the problem is there's closing costs. He didn't realize when I started talking about there's three or 4,000 of closing, there's like $4,000 in closing costs on every one, on both of these loans. He was like, well, that's fine. We'll pay the closing costs. The funny thing is, you know, he didn't realize that that those closing costs, a portion of those closing costs included a broker fee. So we got paid a broker fee again. Anyway, uh, that loan, we got caught then. Um, God, I get caught. got caught all the time. Got caught one time. Um, one of my mortgage brokers, I got a phone call from a bank in Chicago called, um, it was called, uh, gosh, what was it called? Uh, Pinnacle, Pinnacle Bank Corp. And I got a phone call uh, from them, from the, the owner of the bank. And what had happened was one of my mortgage brokers, a guy named Eddie LaFuente, God, he was a problem. Uh he was always getting caught, jammed up, uh, and he wasn't even good for but maybe three or four loans a month anyway. So he he had basically taken the same canceled checks and submitted those canceled checks with 
all of his loans. So every one of his borrowers had the same Bank of America checks, $1,200, Bank of America. He, like he didn't even order the, try, and, try and order verify these people. He's just using all fake documents. Sent it to this company. It just so happened that the same underwriter got two of his files like two days in a row and noticed, hey, these canceled checks look familiar. She then opened up the file he had sent her the day before and they were identical. Except for the signatures and the, the you know, it was filled, they were filled out a little bit differently. The names of the borrowers were different, but the, the numbers, the, the routing numbers, the, the cancellation numbers, everything was identical. I mean, that's, you know, that's uh, obviously that's a problem. And they, they then turned around, they pulled all of La Fuente's files and realized that they had like a million dollars worth of bad loans from this guy. And then they kept pulling files and they had sold another million dollars to household bank. So I get a call from this guy, uh, uh, Gary, who owned the uh, pinnacle bank. And he's like, look, we got $2 million in bad loans. We just sold a million dollars in bad loans that you guys had provided us. Now, keep in mind, a bad loan just means that it's got fraud in it. It doesn't mean that they're not performing. People are paying. They're just not, they're just, they have fraud involved in them. Uh, you know, fraud, there's some fraudulent documents, and those are just the documents that he could see. I mean, who knows what other documents were in there? I remember he said, um, Matt, listen, uh, you know, we, we got an issue. You got, you know, one of your brokers did this. And I remember I go, a rogue broker? He goes, because you, and Gary goes, because you wouldn't know anything about this. I said, I have no idea what this guy did. And I said, I'm just finding out about this. And he explained the situation. And I said, look, Gary, I said, if you're thinking at the end of this phone call that I'm going to cut you a check for a million or $2 million, I said, I'm tell you right now, I don't have the money. I can't do it. And he said, oh, I, I get that. I get that. He goes, look, I just want you to give me your word that if any of these loans come back on us, because lenders have what's called a, um, they have what's called a, a clawback clause, which means if fraud is found in, the, in a loan that they provided, then they have to buy that loan back. Well, he said, if we, we get hit with a, a clawback uh, on the clawback clause, you'll agree to help us get rid of the house or refinance it or whatever. Now, the likelihood that that's going to happen is, is it's, just, it's just it's highly unlikely that once these loans have gone from my brokerage business to the lender and from the lender to another lender like Household Bank, and that six months later they're going to get caught and they're going to notice the fraud, it's highly unlikely. So... You know, I, I was like, yeah, absolutely, no problem. I mean, what am I going to say? It's that, or he says, okay, I'm going to call the FBI. Now, he didn't, he didn't want to call the FBI anyway because the FBI is going to come in and, and do an internal investigation. And they're going to find at least a couple million in bad fraud and bad loans that have been sold, and then Gary's on the hook to buy all these loans back, and it would have been bad. So he says, look, yeah, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll help you get rid of the loans if they come back on your the properties or whatever. And he says, absolutely. He said, man, I appreciate that, no problem. He said, I don't worry about it. Uh, I'll take care of it. So he ends up selling the selling another million dollars to households. That's two million he knows of. And then I remember a week later, he came down and took me and several of the guys out to to dinner or lunch, I forget which, I think it was dinner. And he actually got, got a little drunk. And I remember he told me, listen, man, he said, Matt, to be honest, he said, I don't care if, I don't care if all of these, I don't care how much fraud is, is in these loans. As long as I can get rid of them and they don't come back on me, he was, I could care less. And, so, I mean, that, that, like, that kind of, I think that lets people know, like, that was the environment. That was, like, fraud was, not everybody was committing fraud, but it was, it was extremely prevalent, and it was forgivable, uh, especially the, the more fraud I was caught with. If, if the lender caught me and I had a bunch of fraud with them, I had a better chance of getting a, of convincing them to let me fix it. If if they were and especially if they were so if they were going to lose 100 or 200,000, dollars they were definitely willing to bend over backwards to let me fix this problem. And that was the environment that I was working in. So uh, I'm going to end it here. So check out the next video and in the next video I'm going to basically explain how I end up getting in trouble the first time I get in trouble and I really get jammed up and it's a great story and if you like the video do me a favor and subscribe to the channel hit the like button hit the bell so you get notified when I put out the next video 
Uh, also, leave a comment in the uh, leave a comment in the uh, comment section to let me know if you like this series and like me explaining this whole this whole uh, the whole thing of how I ended up getting involved in fraud and ended up going on the run and the whole thing and how I ended up how I ended up on YouTube running a YouTube channel. So I appreciate it, and I will see you later.